Good evening to all of you. It's always something special about coming apart on a Friday evening. Enjoy stories and worship and music. Some of you heard me tell this. I was talking to one of our students a few years ago that didn't come out of the Adventist tradition. He says there's two words he learned at Loma Linda, vespers and haystacks. <laughs> so good enough. We have an incredible program tonight, uh, sharing some rather fantastic stories. So we're pleased to have all of you here to share that with us. We invited John McGee, class of 74. It's a long time ago, John, uh, from the School of Public Health uh, yes. to offer opening prayer. John? Thank you. Would you just pray with me in any way that finds you close to the arms of God? Father God, we come to you with singing, and we come into your presence singing Alleluia. I praise you because you are black and brown, yellow, red, and white, O oh God. I thank you that everyone is the same in your loving sight. O oh Elohim, you are holy. O oh Bhagwan, you are our creator. O oh Allah, you are most gracious. O oh Dios, you are righteous. On behalf of my colleague health professionals, O oh God, I thank you for the privilege of being and training medical missionaries. And I thank you for Loma Linda University's global reach to make men and women whole. On behalf of my Adventist, agnostic, atheist, Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and Protestant brothers and sisters who attended Loma Linda University, I thank you for your sweet, sweet healing spirit who gave us the balm of Gilead to share with sick ones living in over 200 countries. On behalf of the hungry children in Gaza, I ask for meat and rice. On behalf of our university chef, I ask a blessing on the over 10,000 meals his team is preparing for us this weekend. And on behalf of the Loma Linda University Church prayer team, I ask for a refreshing rain of renewed friendships and restored relationships. Merci, mon Dieu. Alhamdulillah. Amen. Thank you, John. And as you can tell, John's got a rich cultural background growing up in Pakistan and serving out there as well. So thank you for being with us. This first story starts uh, about 55 years ago in the late 1960s when a group of medical students uh, noticed that there was a lot of migrant farm workers and hippies who had come to California about that time. Some of you remember those days brightly colored Volkswagen buses and a few other things that they came down to wonderful California. And the medical students decided we should do something about that. Uh, and so they rounded up two different places to start evening clinics. They'd go out to doctor's offices and borrow uh, steel or take sample medicines, not illegal today, but we did back then, and collect medicines and start evening clinics. And Dr. Harvey Elder and some others uh, chiefed us uh, and clinics were started. It was called Social Action Corps back then. It's actually the university church was the official sponsor. And that went on for about 30 years uh, in the basement of a Salvation Army church in North Redlands, and a community center out in by Bloomington, another community center in West San Bernardino, Frazee. Uh, and then in 1995, we were given the new clinic, an old clinic actually new for us, at Norton Air Force Base, and it converted to civilian use. And we were in heaven. Instead of sheets hanging between the exam tables with unair conditioned rooms, we had an air conditioned clinic with some 70, 17 dental operatories and about 40 exam rooms. And that's when SAC went up to change its name the first time to call Social Action Community Health System. Uh, and a few years later, became a federally qualified health center. And our patient volume went from about 3,000 people a year to 30,000 people a year. And then about seven or eight years ago, we once again outgrew our space uh, and bought land in San Bernardino along the freeway and built the current, what we call the San Bernardino campus. 
SAC has had an incredible history. It's now a legal corporation, uh, quite different than what we started with when it was all volunteer. And we're just delighted this evening to feature SAC and some of the things that they have done. We're going to begin with a video, and then I'm going to invite Dr. Jason Lohr, who's the president of SAC, together with a resident, a student, and a patient to come up and share with us. So enjoy the video. SAC Health is comprised of dedicated, unwavering professionals at every level. I love this place. I love its people. I love our mission. And I would not want to be anywhere else but here. Here at SAC, we are the nation's FQHC with the most number of medical specialties. A typical day for me would be coming into to the clinic. I do a mix of administration and clinical, and the clinical time I'm working with family medicine residents in the family medicine clinic, precepting them as they see patients. So being able to see those patients, connect with them, connect with them on a deeper level, be able to pray with patients, be able to offer them that spiritual support, I think is probably the most valuable and, and the best part of the job for me. Well, the best part of my job is working with people who are so committed to the mission, vision, values of this organization, watching them just achieve their dreams professionally and deliver care to communities that really are underserved. There is no typical day here at SAC because we are growing so much. So every day, I never know what to expect. Literally the day before we had to close our doors for patients coming in due to all the COVID restrictions, we had just turned on our first virtual video visit. We set our date for our first telehealth visit on March 12, 2020. Well, those who know that week in March, that was when all the clinics had to screen patients and had to close to any patients who had any symptoms that could be COVID related. We had that first virtual visit the day before on March 12. I believe that wasn't just coincidence or good luck, but that was a divine intervention and provision for us to be able to have our very first telehealth visit one day before. With the pandemic, we learned to do video visits, telephone visits. The blessing is that because we could pivot so quickly, we really only dropped in our patient volumes for four weeks. And after four weeks, our patient volumes were as high or higher than they were pre-COVID. It kept us in a position financially that we were able to, we never let anyone go. We never laid anyone off. We actually gave salary increases. When most health systems were putting things on hold, we're letting people go. We were able to give an increase that year and we've given increases every year. At SAC, we are so blessed to have a mobile unit. The utility is that we can now provide care to patients who don't have a way of coming here. For instance, the dental mobile unit Unit has been used in homeless shelters. It's huge. I think the biggest thing that we were able to accomplish in the last year was opening the clinics in Barstow and Blythe. It required a lot of teamwork. It was very heavy lifting. These are truly rural locations, especially Blythe. It's two and a half hours away from our main site in San Bernardino, right next to the border with Arizona. This is the first time that that community has ever had board certified physicians seeing Medi-Cal patients, ever. I mean, these are what we would call our, our local missionaries uh, working in that community. They had just signed up to go to Guam as missionaries after they finished residency. And we told them there's another mission field and it's called Blythe. <laughs> and God bless their hearts. Um, they prayed about it, we prayed about it, and they signed up and that's where they are. So our Barstow Clinic, it was a divine intervention. We found that location. There was a physician who had been in practice for about 30, 40 years, and these were the offices right across from the hospital. It was October, it was November, and we're gonna open this clinic in January 1. So I'm like, okay, we don't have anyone for permanently committed. And it was December 10, just three weeks before we're opening, when I got that phone call from a CEO of another health center saying, we're gonna need to close our health center in Barstow, the only other health center in the entire town. We, we have doctors, I'm sure you've already hired, but they're gonna need jobs. And I said, we can work on that. There's not a problem. We'll take those patients. We'll actually take on those uh, those physicians, and we were able to, to hire them. We're very excited about the opportunity to create a foundation, to start a foundation that SAC Health would help to fund. 
to give back to the community. How we plan out going forward, I, mean, I think back to when this building opened, we would have never thought that we would be bursting at the seams. Well, we're excited to share that uh, we found this building. Just between San Bernardino and Loma Linda, right across the street from the Costco. 285,000 square feet. We plan to have all the services there, specialty services, behavioral health, dental services, primary care services. I mean, this, this will be a, a huge blessing and benefit for, for the community. I'm most proud of, in 2022, the organization poured about $4 million into salary wages and benefits uh, to help the staff. The thing that makes me most proud about SAC Health is to be able to combine faith-based, underserved health care. I love this place. I love its people. I love our mission. And I would not want to be anywhere else but here. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. So grateful to be able to share the story of SAC and what has happened and so grateful for those who have done the work before us back in the 60s and 70s and 80s to get us to where we are today and uh, so grateful for, for that leadership that has brought us to today. This evening we're going to be sh uh, interviewing a few folks. So I'm going to start with Anthony. Anthony Baca is a third year medical student and he's actually an IHP scholar, which means he's actually being sponsored by the local health plan to stay in the Inland Empire to serve Medi-Cal patients. Anthony, tell us how you got into to med school and how you chose to become an IHP scholar. Well, that's a, okay, that's a long question. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect that for the first question, but so I got into med school, so I was a Bible teacher in Arizona. I was out there for 10 years as a religion teacher, as a public evangelist. I worked for the Pacific Union Conference, um, covered uh, all the different conferences I would travel and preach. And then I got connected with Amen Clinics. I don't know if you know what Amen Clinics are. Yes. And I fell in love. Um, in fact, I had more fun participating with my friends at the Amen Clinics than I was at my own job for a season there. And a really good friend of mine who was a physician actually told me, he says, what? Maybe this is a calling. Why don't you consider? Why don't you pray about it? And uh, I, I always said I'm being a, a Bible teacher my whole life. So that was kind of where I was going. Um, but as I incorporated the healing message and the holistic outreach, we did some powerful um, cooking schools for the communities. We connected with the local Walmart. And they cleared their clothing sections so we can do health expos in the clothing sections at Walmart. Wow. And... That evangelistic series that we did were numbers like we had not seen um, here in the States. Something you might see overseas, but not here in the States. And I said, there's something to helping people with their physical needs and meeting them where they're at and helping them to just take care of their, what's going on in their life today to open their heart to Jesus and giving him an opportunity. And so that was kind of the, the road in a very short condensed version that led me to pre-med took my first class, and I left it in the Lord's hands. I said, if I fail it, I'm going back to teaching. Um, and I said, but I didn't, and I didn't fail to this day. T today's exam still passed, so praise right, God. Right, so you, you are a pastor evangelist. In fact, when I saw you in clinic two months ago, I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking, you did an evangelistic series at my church, and there's a third-year medical student. I thought, they can't be the same person. You know, it's not like you have an evangelistic series five years ago and now you're in med school. So I was very confused until I found out you are the same person. And so you basically saw the benefit of the health work in evangelism and said, I'm going to enter med school. In a, in a nutshell, in a very, very condensed version, yes, it was a process of about six years uh, for that to take place. And I remember it culminated with a back injury that took me out of a free Europe trip, uh, a great controversy tour. And I was really sad about that. But I had just got a bunch of Spirit of Prophecy books on the health message and different health books. And I started reading, how could you do more health evangelism? And I just got so on fire. I was like, there's got to be more. There's got to be something more. Um, and obviously, we were limited uh, with, what we, with what we knew, what we had. So me and a good friend of mine uh, both pursued becoming doctors so that we can go back and be more effective evangelists. Wow. Uh, that is the big picture. How do you integrate it during med school and during your rotations? Yeah. Spiritual care. So one of the big things that I get a privilege to participate in is uh, homeless outreach is what we typically refer to it as, or just kind of going out to San Bernardino. I'm from San Bernardino myself. 
Um, in fact, for a number of uh, years, I was homeless myself. I lived at the local Walmart in my car for a number of years uh, back in the day. Uh, my family lived there, so I get to go out there and mingle with friends in the wash, get to know them, connect with them. Uh, we did some wound cleaning the other weekend um, and really just get to serve and remind myself why I'm in medical school, why we do the 12 hours a day every day of reading, studying, and taking tests. It's so I can go and help these people. Um, I also still preach. I'm doing an evangelistic series here on Loma Linda campus starting next Friday at 7 o'clock on the rooftop. Uh, so if you want to come, come on out next Friday at 7. But um, can't let step one stop you from preaching the word of God, right? <laughs> So you're doing a, a full evangelistic series in the midst of being third-year medical student. Um, and, and this is, how many times have they had a student do a, a program like this before? Yeah, so I'm actually at my transition from second year into third year. We had our final exam today. So I guess technically I am third year now, technically. Wow. I do got to pass step one in <laughs> six weeks. Very good. Pray for that. <laughs> Um, so but, now that you're third year, you have plenty of time. So that's why you can do an evangelistic ex series. Exactly. No, so uh, <laughs> first time they've had a student preach the series on, on campus for restoration. Wow. So, yeah. What a blessing. Yeah, I'm excited. Well, thank you for sharing. We really appreciate, appreciate you sharing, Anthony. Course, and thank you. Your whole experience and, and, and what you're doing and your future being an IHP scholar, you're going to have to stay in the Inland Empire and, and be seeing, taking care of Medi-Cal medi patients. That was a steal of a deal. I was going to stay anyways, you know, and then they come and say, can we help pay for your school for you to stay? Absolutely. <laughs> Why wouldn't you say yes to something like that? No, I, I look forward to serving in the area, uh, especially because these are my roots. These are where I came from. And I look forward to giving back to the community uh, that I was raised in. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have Adwa, who's one of our uh, family medicine residents. So tell me how you got into medicine to start with. Yeah, I'd say that my journey has started way back. Um, I'm someone that is a missionary kid. Um, I was born in Ethiopia to Ghanaian and Zambian parents. And so I've been surrounded in the medicine community for, since a young age. But as I grew up and I understood more, I started thinking, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to commit to that. Um, but I just chose to surrender my life to God. And um, honestly, like, God had plans. Um, when I started my undergrad um, at UCR, I applied with an undeclared major. And um, I was just leaving it open to where God would lead me. And while I was sitting there in the orientation, uh, they were really advertising this idea of learning communities. And they said, well, if you are, you know, coming from a school and you're going to be in a big auditorium, you might get lost. Might be a good idea to do this learning community thing where they will group you with small amounts of people and you will study and learn and grow together. So that sounded good to me. So I decided to go and try to sign up. But they said, well, with an undeclared major, there's really super long of a waiting list, and chances are you're not gonna get in. But if you switch your major right now to biochemistry, you'll get a guaranteed spot. So I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. Um, they said, don't worry, just take a minute to think about it, and you can come back and let us know at the end of the, at the, end of the orientation. So I went back to my seat, and I sat down, and I prayed really hard, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I just felt this overwhelming peace to go ahead and do it. And uh, so at the end of it, I just said, okay, um, I guess I'm switching my major to biochem. Um, and so he was like, okay, you're in. So after that, I just remember thinking to myself, oh man, what did I do? Um, <laughs> but then like God had a way of really reassuring me, like I kid you not, multiple people while I was walking on the campus would come up to me and ask me, what's your major? And I would tell them, uh, biochemistry, kind of stuttering, because I wasn't super confident. Um, and they were like, oh, I'm in that major. It's not that bad. And so after multiple people telling me the same thing, people I didn't even know, I was like, OK, maybe God is trying to tell me something. And so then I started thinking, what can I do with a biochem major? The only thing that felt remotely interesting was medicine. And so I decided to stick to it, and it really felt like that was what God was gearing me to do. And the more that I learned and I grew in, in my understanding of what medicine is, and I also saw the health challenges that um, I saw in the people closest to me, it gave me more fire to my bones to pursue medicine. 
Um, and so here I am. <laughs> wow. What, what, have you, um, how, what have you enjoyed working at the SAC clinic specifically during your residency training? You know, I really have enjoyed the connection with patients. It's such a unique population. Um, oftentimes, our patients are facing a lot of challenges. Sometimes they might have had to catch the bus to get there. Um, sometimes it might have been homelessness. It might have been you know, juggling so many jobs to support their multiple children. And I also felt, feel a sense of connection because I too was a SAC patient. When we first came to this country, we came to SAC as, a, as I was a SAC patient. So I felt like I had that connection with the patients and just learning their stories. I don't know, it's like you just are able to see how God is working in individual lives. And it's such a, it's such a privilege to be in a place where I can be a part of the journey. Yeah. What are your future plans? I would love to stay at SAC. Um, uh, this next year, I plan to uh, do my preventative medicine fellowship training. So I will be uh, training for another year, and afterwards, um, God willing, I will be here. <laughs> Wonderful. What a blessing. Thank you for sharing your story. Okay. <laughs> the final interview this evening is with one of our patients, Miss Vicki. Thank you for being here this evening with your husband and your sister, and we're so excited to have you with us. Vicki has a very powerful story to share. She, we started Grand Rounds a, a couple years ago where we would feature patients that would share their stories with our employees. And one of the most powerful things we've ever done is our patients sharing their experience with our team. And Vicki was our fir very first, very first patient to share her story with our team. And it's been probably the most powerful story that we've ever heard. Um, and so I asked her to come back several years later now <laughs> yes. and share again with us. Vicki, tell us about your experience um, through your life and, and what kind of brought you to Loma Linda, to the SAC clinic, and, um, and how God used that. Well, what brought me here was uh, my childhood trauma. My childhood trauma became my adulthood chaos and a blueprint for my self-destruction. So um, that made me make a lot of bad decisions, chose choosing the wrong people to be around. So my life was chaotic till I was about 20. And I met this man. I thought he was God. He was everything to me. But I didn't know he was going to be abusive, severely abusive. So the end of our relationship, he choked me until I couldn't talk anymore. I lost my voice. I only could speak above a whisper. So from the time I was 20 till 2009, I had to be in my 40s by then. Um, I had been to every hospital, every speech therapist you could think of. And so my husband that I have now for 10 years, for the first 10 years, I only talked above a whisper. He had to speak for me. My sisters had to speak for me because I, nobody understood me. People thought I was on drugs. They didn't want to be around me. So I continued, before I met my husband, I continued to make bad decisions. So... The, the husband went to prison, but then I fell into to the gang life. And so I met the same type of man because that's what I thought my worth was. I had no quality. I couldn't talk, so I just did whatever they told me to do. And I did whatever they told me to do. So once I married my husband, my whole life changed, the new husband. And we're in almost 30 years now. Um, he's the one that took me to... Cedar Sinai, we went to Centennial, I've been to Long Beach Hospital, I've been to Dignity, everybody said it was in my mind. I've been to every speech therapist you could think of, but one speech therapist at Dignity said, you need to go to Loma Linda, and I did. And it was in 2009, and the speech therapist, I think I seen her twice, she said, we have a new procedure I think it'll work for you. I said, whatever, <laughs> nothing else worked. Might as well try it. So it was the Botox 
they would go through my nose and back down behind, they still do it, and um, give me, I think it's five milligrams of Botox in order for my muscles to move. When it first happened, it only lasted like two months. They had to do it in the operating room because insurance wouldn't pay for it. We had to pay the first $3,000 because they said Botox was cosmetic. So Dr. Sock, he went through writing a letter to an insurance, and so for about a year, I would have to go every two to three months because it wouldn't last. But now I'm up to six months. Mm. Every six months I go every May and every uh, November. But um, with that, I went through a lot of mental things, a lot of mental breakdowns because I couldn't understand why this was happening to me. But when he gave me the quality of life again, where I could speak and everybody can hear me now. So I chose to go on to psychology. I have a master's in psychology and an MBA. I'm working on my doctrine. Thank you. I have, I have worked with sexual assault, domestic violence, I'm an advocate for human trafficking. I am the girl to come see about human trafficking. And now I work with level 14 girls, which are human trafficked, some are incest, um, some are severely emotionally abused. So I've worked with um, sex offenders. I facilitate groups, pro -lease. I have very successful people I have worked with because for me to be able to do what I do, I had to go through my journey. First, I used to be mad at God. And, he, and I said, he gave me a journey because I can now change some lives. And you better believe I changed some lives because you can hear me now. And when, when it comes to anything to do with trauma, I'm it. I'm the one. I went through everything you can imagine. But here I stand today at almost 62 years old. Mm. And I'm making a difference. And it's all because of God. Amen. That's all because of God. Vicki, I know that you, had, um, you also had a, a surgery. Oh, several. Yeah. Yes. From the abuse, I, the husband would dislocate my shoulder and he would pop it back for me. So, you know, and after years come, I couldn't, um, I had bone to bone, so here I am, back at Loma Linda, they fixed both of my shoulders. Um, I'm able to move. Um, yes, I deal, still deal with arthritis because of the abuse, but it's a reminder every day that I have now have quality of life because my story can make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. My education can make a difference. And people who care and listen, you can make some changes. The powerful story of someone being a victim of domestic violence, becoming a licensed therapist, and then taking care of those who are committing those acts mm -hmm. of domestic violence. That is so powerful. And I remember when you shared with us several years ago, you said the first question you asked those perpetrators is, mm -hmm. What's your trauma? Yes, who, who perped you? Because the sex offenders said they had never had anybody ask them who perped them. Um, I learned a lot from them, and I understand my own. I was sexually assaulted from the time I was six to I was 15. So, of course, I had no worth. That's why I made the decisions I made, and that's how I ended up where I was. But I'm not there anymore. That's right. I'm not there anymore. And I, like I said, I thank God and my husband every day, family, friends. But some people can't, can't take my story because it's, it's, a, it's a lot deeper than I'm telling. But um, I think it can still, if you hear some of it, you can still understand. When you see somebody in trouble, stop and just ask them, are you okay? Because sometimes that's all it takes. Because our youth today are in trouble. They're suffering, they're hurt. They have nobody. Christmas, they just sit in the facility and we, we're their only connection. 
So sometimes just take a moment and think about those kids and say a prayer for them because they're so empty and, and lonely. But they come to me because they know I understand. I don't give them sympathy, I give them empathy. Sometimes they just want you to listen, they don't want you to talk to them. They just want to tell you. That's right. That's so right. just ask sometime, are you okay? Thank you so much, Vicki, mm -hmm. for having the courage to share your story. Thank you. You know, you've done that, I know, more than once, and we really <laughs> appreciate it. It takes a lot of courage to share a story like you, you've had, you. and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. It's because of those stories and many more that uh, we have the privilege tonight of giving to SAC Health our Community Engagement Award from Loma Linda. We give this out once a year to individuals or organizations that have made a significant impact in our local community. And SAC is a huge benefit uh, exemplifying all the values of Loma Linda. So let me read that award, but before I do, I want all the people that work at SAC to please stand. We've got some of the staff that are here. Please stand and remain standing uh, while we read through this. <clears throat> Loma Linda University Health honors SAC Health for their mission-driven, community-minded, and dedicated service to our local communities, providing much-needed health care to medically underserved populations with over 200,000 visits annually including primary and specialty care, as well as dental and behavioral health services. For their exemplary support and commitment to education, partnering with Loma Linda University Health in the educational development of hundreds of medical professionals annually. For their alignment and commitment to this institution's motto, to make man whole, and presents to them the Community Engagement Award, Loma Linda, California, March 1, 2024. Congratulations to SAC Health. And I want to invite Emily and Delayla to come up. Emily is one of our vice presidents here at the Medical Center with roots in Kenya. Uh, has become actively involved in some of our international activities as well. And some of us were in Uganda last June, I guess it was, July, June. Uh, we have an amazing lady in the villa here, Dr. Mildred Stilson, who is now 103 years old. She and her husband, uh, Don Stilson, started Ishaka Hospital in southern Uganda in the 1950s. She is still living. And so we went out to celebrate Ishaka's 75th anniversary and to hold a medical clinic with a large group of 80-some people. And while we were there, we met an incredible an instrument, not instrumental, musical group that I'm going to let Emily tell us about. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart. Um, so in Africa, it is um, polite to return a visit. So we took over 80 people to Uganda, but the Uganda Union sends us six. But I think the six are just as good as um, the 80. But um, six young men, all the way from Kampala, Uganda, are joining us this evening. They are called Jehovah Shalom a cappella. And I have come to discover that they are the Sabbath afternoon activity for a lot of people. Um, on YouTube, a lot of families spend time watching them, and they have had, I think last year, over 30 million views just on their YouTube channel alone. Some of them are brothers, three of them are brothers, um, but what is impressive about them is that they have tra stayed true to their calling, true to their mission of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through music. They do a lot of Adventist hymns, and they also support the community. They partner with churches to build churches in Uganda. They feed the homeless and orphans in the community. And now they are here to help um, share the need that exists within the healthcare um, work in Uganda. They have a message for us. And the message is, there is a need. 
They need doctors in Uganda. They need resources in Uganda to help build the hospital, such as the one that Dr. Stilson started 75 years ago. So if you would like to find out more, if you're interested in serving, see Dr. Hart. <laughs> Um, we're happy to give you information. Um, please let us know. And tomorrow night, they'll be at Campus Hill at 6 p.m. Um, doing a concert and sharing more of their story. But in the meantime, I present to you Jehovah Shalom, a cappella here with a message for us. Welcome, Jehovah Shalom.
Thank you, Jehovah Shalom. I look forward to hearing you tomorrow afternoon as well up in the Campus Hill Church at 6. Our next story starts a long time ago. In 1895, 128 years ago, the Adventist Church started its first medical school. It was called American Medical Missionary College in Battle Creek, Michigan. John Harvey Kellogg was the dean. And young Adventist kids came in there and started studying medicine. The first graduating class in 1899, the president was a fellow by the name of Alfred Shryock. Some of you recognize that name. Joined this university out here shortly after that. And we have a building named after him now that houses our School of Pharmacy. The class in 1902 had another fellow in there from Ohio by the name of Harry Miller. Some of you will recognize that name. Dr. Miller got married after graduation in 1903. He moved to Shanghai, China to start medical work in that great country. And because of his work, soon the church was starting to be organized out there, and Dr. Miller was actually head of that church operation in China for a while. His wife died about two years later in China. He came home, went to Washington, D.C., and helped to be the medical director of Washington Adventist Hospital for 10 years. Got remarried, went back to China, and spent the rest of his career working in China. He came to be an excellent thyroid doctor. I'm assuming that the Chinese soil and food did not have much iodine in it, so there's a lot of goiters. So he became an excellent thyroid, doing thyroid surgeries. He also, of course, uh, figured out that the best answer to malnutrition in China was making drink out of soybeans. And some of you are old enough to remember Soilac. That was Harry Miller's invention, figured out how to leach uh, soybeans in China and turn it into soy milk, came back over here, started Worthington Foods actually in time, and helped Loma Linda Foods as well. During Harry Miller's time in China, he started 19 hospitals across China. Incredible legacy that he left. When Mao Zedong started the long march across China, uh, Harry Miller had to get out, so he moved down to Taiwan with others. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek gave him their honored award down there in Taiwan, and Harry Miller started a hospital in Taipei, Taiwan. In 1960, he went back to Hong Kong and started Hong Kong Adventist Hospital in Hong Kong, what we now know as Stubbs Road Hospital. That's Harry Miller. What's amazing is that almost exactly 100 years ago, the best we can figure out, a young mother in Shanghai, China, brought her 16-year-old son to Harry Miller's hospital in Shanghai to be treated. That young boy's name was Run Run Shaw. And he was cared for by, we don't know whether he actually met Harry Miller himself or was treated at the hospital, but he was cared for at an Adventist facility as a young boy. When the Great March forced him out, he also moved to Hong Kong, started a large industry there, major movie producer, shipping industry, did a number of different things and became a very wealthy philanthropist. He also sought Adventist health care in Hong Kong at Stubbs Road Hospital that Harry Miller had started in Hong Kong. And about 35 or so years ago now, he says, I want to develop a Western hospital in my home province of Zhejiang, Zhejiang, China. And so he thought in his mind, what, who can do that for me? And reached out some and finally somebody, go ask the Adventist. So he contacted Neil Wilson, who was president of the General Conference at that time. As they tend to do, Neil Wilson says, go talk to Loma Linda. Uh, and so we were put in contact and the origins of Sir Run Run Shaw Hospital began. Uh, and we are now celebrating this year our 30th anniversary of Sir Run Shaw Hospital, an incredible institution. 
And I want to show you a video of what this looks like now, what has happened over that 30 years. We just had 12 representatives from the Shaw Foundation that funded it, plus the Servant Shaw Hospital here on our campus uh, Monday and Tuesday. And we celebrated them at our board meetings. They couldn't stay. They're on their way back already. Uh, but what an impact it has had. Uh, frankly, operating kind of undercover uh, in many respects. But enjoy this video about Servant and Shaw Hospital. Every time I come, I think back 35 years now when an old man in Hong Kong of the name of Sir Renwin Shaw decided he wanted to plant a hospital in his home province uh, and reached out to Zhejiang University and reached out to Loma Linda University. You know, I think it's amazing that Sir Renwin Shaw himself had this unique vision of asking Zhejiang University to partner with a Western uh, academic medical center to see how the two systems could blend together to actually make a unique creation in a Chinese academic medical center. That vision, uh, I think, was really prescient. Uh, he created something that did not exist before. We were actually quite good friends, very good. I first met him before uh, they ever started doing anything with the hospital. I spent quite a bit of time and effort uh, working out kind of an outline of what would be a good program on just better health, health habits and so on. Something that you could interest the general public while the plans are still being decided and so on, we could do this. And oh, he says, absolutely not. <laughs> He said, I don't want that. I want a hospital. I first arrived here, I seized the warm and the sincerity and uh, gave me some confidence. And uh, I said, well, this may be, it's a good start. It was a new hospital. Staff were young, impressionable. They'd never worked together before. So a new culture was started. As they started their careers, that culture was forming jointly with staff from Loma Linda. Very beginning, the uh, doctor is a very crucial because we all are very young. They be like the Dr. Hadley said, all are kids. <laughs> I think the values and the beliefs that Loma Linda hold have been instilled to the heart of people here. Because it's just like in a family, you were grown up in that family and you carry some values and beliefs. Although we were over here to help begin a hospital, we felt like our role here was above and beyond that. God has had us here for a purpose, and we had to take advantage of every single opportunity that we had to be able to reach out to people. Of course, it was just the day-to-day -day working with people and, and praying that somehow these people would see God revealed through us. So it's been a wonderful relationship. The part that surprised me perhaps the most is Running a hospital is a lot of technical, clinical information, logistics information. But even more important here has been the capturing of values and the inner sort of personal feeling that people have. The first time that I visited Sarunan Shah Hospital was almost 20 years ago. And the very first thing that I saw were two clocks on the wall. One said Serenon Shaw Hospital time, and the other said Loma Linda University time, LLU time. And I thought that was such a touching moment to see that. It has been amazing to me how the cross-cultural relationship has enriched all of us, both in personal friendships and of course professionally. The communities of Loma Linda and Serenon Shaw are drawn together by more than just agreements. They're drawn together by purpose and passion and a mission to heal the communities and be a, a beacon of light and hope in the communities that we serve. It is truly a sharing of our hearts with theirs. And remember, this hospital starts with love and good value. 
because with one man have a good heart and good will, want to give the best in healthcare to his people. I'd like to invite some of my colleagues to come forward now that have worked out at Turner and Shaw and share a bit of their experience on this incredible thing. I don't know if you caught that picture, but this started with one 400-bed hospital. Turner and Shaw now has, I think, six campuses with a total of 8,000 beds in, in Hangzhou itself. What an impact they are making uh, in this particular area. So as they come forward, uh, Jan Zumwalt, she thinks she's retired, uh, but has been heavily involved. Uh, Dan Jung, our Vice President for Graduate Medical Education. Shirley Lee taught in our dental hygiene program here for many years. And Joanna Yang, who is a nurse practitioner at DNP, works with neurosurgery department here. All Neurology. Have been Pardon? Neurology. Neurology. Uh, I expect Dan to correct me on that. Not neurosurgery, neurology, sorry. Uh, Dan's a neurologist. Uh, so I'm going to quiz you guys. They all want to know what I'm going to ask them, but I find it's better just to not tell them. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Jan. I think you worked out there the longest. I didn't say you were the oldest. I just said you worked out there the longest. Uh, tell me, how many times have you been to China? Probably about 70 times. 70, 70, 7 zero. 7 zero over 30 years. My first trip was a nursing trip in 1988, one of the nurses to nurses trip that I did on a vacation time. Uh -huh. And Jan, who has helped to start a Global Health <coughs> Institute here uh, for many years, which helps to coordinate all this. And I think when, when the folk were here from China the, earlier this week, the whole issue of culture, uh, particularly the nursing culture, uh, was a significant factor uh, Jerry Winslow shared that their values, sincerity, confidence, and love, uh, kind of arose about the same time we were sorting out our values back here at Loma Linda. Talk to us about the nursing culture there, Jan, and what, what came, comes out of that. Okay, in the very beginning, nursing, the nurses were very young. Nurses could not choose to go to this hospital to work. The government selected them. And so, because they had a nursing shortage, sort of like we do here, um, they took new graduates that knew English a little bit and assigned them to Sir Run Run Shaw Hospital, along with a few experienced nurses. And their, their culture, they became proud of working there as nurses, and they, had, they developed different from other hospitals a nursing department. So nurses had an orientation and did things the same way on different departments. At that time in China, nurses primarily on a unit just reported to the doctor that was in charge of that unit. So it was very disconnected. And over time, they, towards the 2000s, they sort of got to saying, oh, we can't do this here. We can't lock the stack cart. We can't um, take care of the, the meds uh, safely like you do in the United States because we don't have as many nurses. And then we introduced them to joint commission. And um, of course, we all have joint commission here. All hospitals have to have it. But there was a Joint Commission International, which was probably about 80% the same as ours here. And when they discovered that other hospitals internationally were following rules and doing things safely and so on, they suddenly began reaching to improve. And no more did we really hear, um, you know, we can't do this. And so I saw a whole new benefit of Joint Commission that I never saw when I was working here. I mean, how many people have gone back and forth? I think roughly, you know, Mo or Bing knows this, roughly a thousand? I think we've had, a, yes, probably a thousand people, have come this physicians, direction. nurses, and others. And 2,000 have gone that direction? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's so huge. It's a huge transfer of knowledge 
and passion and friendship that's gone back and forth. Right. And certainly the nursing culture has changed dramatically over there through the years. Yes. Uh, Patients, I remember I would ask them when they came here to Loma Linda, what do you see that's different? Is there anything different here than at, at, in China? And they said, here, and a number of nurses said this separately, here, your doctors and nurses take care of patients like they would a family member. Mm -hmm. And so they took that back to Sir Ren Ren Cha Hospital and started modeling that. And uh, so that made a huge difference in the culture of the way patients were cared for at this hospital. Other hospitals over there are now, you know, trending to do the same thing. I've had the privilege of being out there a number of times with Jan. One of the things the Chinese do for us, which is very helpful, they adopt an American name that we can pronounce. <laughs> because otherwise it's hard to do that. And Jan seems to know all of them and remembers their names uh, far better than I can out there. So thank you, Jan. I'm not done with you yet, but let me go on to Dan. Uh, Dan Jung is a neurologist, uh, chairman of our department of neurology here for many years, now vice president for graduate medical education. But Dan, let me start with your mother. What did she do out there? So my mom uh, grew up in China, of course, and she came to uh, Emmanuel Missionary College to study, became a dietitian, and she always wanted to give back to China something of, that she had learned in the U.S. And at the time, the Saren Renshaw Project was starting with Dr. Fong, Dr. Hadley, and others. Uh, she got wind of this in Tacoma Park and would volunteer to come out to Saren Renshaw Hospital before it was built and start talking about dietetics and how to start a kitchen and how to keep things clean. And so she was uh, one of those people shuttling back and forth trying to help get the whole entire hospital started. She'd come back to see me and say, you know, this is a really interesting thing, great project, you should get involved with it. And I was busy, didn't have a lot of time, but eventually uh, things worked out so that I could get to go out there right about the time that they had made the decision they wanted to go for joint commission. And so Jan and I had the privilege of going there numerous times to help prepare the hospital and to get them ready to have the Joint Commission International uh, surveyors come. It was an incredible time. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was great fun to see the nurses and the physicians get into this idea of performance improvement. We can look at data and actually improve our services and make things more efficient uh, and, and do things in a better way. Uh, one, one of the times we were out there, um, <coughs> Joanna and I were there to help start a stroke service. And we decided one of the things we could do is to actually run through what would it be like if a stroke patient came to the emergency room and went all the way through their system. And I got to play the stroke patient and Joanna was there trying to help the nurses and doctors get organized. And they learned a lot from that visit about things that they said, hey, this, this step took 10 minutes. We don't need that 10 minutes if we had this other way of, of doing it. And so that was the kind of thing that you could watch the staff do this. And one of the great things that, I don't know if Saran Shaw thought of this or if it just happened, but by starting a brand new hospital, as Jan was saying, you had all these young nurses. And the same thing with their medical staff. You had this mass of people who had just finished their fellowship, just finished their residency, suddenly going there and saying, we can do things differently. We can, we can take another step forward. This is fun to do and fun to see. So that was, it was great fun watching that. Talk to us, Dan. You also were heavily involved in helping to start some of their residency programs, bringing their residents and their faculty here on clinical rotations. Uh, I don't know how many people have come that way, but uh, tell us a bit about that. So we, we've, uh, I don't think I started it, <laughs> Dick, but uh, certainly got to, got to help out with that. And so we would have regularly young physicians, usually in their fellowship at Saran Shaw, because Saran Shaw is connected 
they're very proud to tell you this, with the third most prestigious medical school in China, they always refer to themselves as the Stanford of China. And so these young professionals would come to Loma Linda, some of them would only stay for two or three months and sort of get a flavor of how to teach, what we were doing in teaching, what was new um, in as far as teaching or uh, practice. Some would stay for a year to learn a technique. They would go back. Uh, we, one, of the, one of the interesting things is in China at the time, a lot of universities were sending folks to the United States. They were usually physicians. One of the differences is that at Saran Ran Shaw, if a physician was coming over here to learn about a new technique, we would also make sure that we had a bunch of nurses and other folks who were going to support that physician come over to learn their part of the system as well. And we learned that that was a great way to set up new programs uh, in foreign countries. Shirley, dental hygienists. Uh, we discovered fairly early on that dental hygiene really didn't exist in China to a significant degree. We did some on-the-job training, uh, and then you've kind of picked it up from there. A dentist was upgraded, uh, and tell us a little bit about where that's going. So currently, we have graduated the first um, cohort of dental hygiene students in June of 2023. Um, we started out with just uh, the practical part. We we taught at Saran Ran Shah Hospital, but was picked up by Zhejiang University City College, and they decided they wanted to have an, a certificate program in dental hygiene that was attached to the nursing program. And so we started from scratch, creating a curriculum, getting the approval from the ministries of education, and all of that stuff was, um, to begin a program in China. And so we are working on our second cohort that's going through for graduation in June and looking forward to what this is gonna do for the country of China. Um, the first graduating class are pioneers in, in the, the dental hygiene profession and they are the ones that are gonna build that foundation for the dental profession. And in the system in China, so what we've done is actually, this is built off of two years of nursing school and then the third year, they do dental hygiene. Sir Ronan Shaw is the clinical operation for that. So they're under uh, Hangzhou City College uh, for the nursing thing. Then they go to the practical part of it. Hangzhou set up a whole lab there for them. And they get their clinical training in the, in the hospital and elsewhere. And the goal is to establish dental hygiene in the country? It is. Um, we are working to establish it as a profession. The biggest challenge right now is to get the dentists on board. Who are these people? What are dental hygienists? How do we utilize them? And once they realize how effective and how efficient it will make them, it will be their second set of eyes. So when you have four eyes looking, um, then you build that profession. And so we're looking forward to granting that for, for the country of China, making a difference in the oral health care there, and in turn making a difference in their general oral health and their general health. Let me go to Joanna. Uh, I hear stories about you all interviewing prospective students because we've got, tell us that we've got both dental hygiene going and now started respiratory therapy. Respiratory therapy builds off the medical school uh, and the students in that. Uh, and tell us about, Joanna's kind of the coordinator for this now and uh, she can communicate better than most of us can. Uh, so tell us about respiratory therapy and then also what it's like to interview students and the values you look for in the students that are coming in. Thank you, Dr. Hart. So um, we basically uh, started this collaboration since 2018. Um, we started with dental hygiene and respiratory therapy, those two emerging professions in China. Uh, when Dr. Hart discussed about dental hygiene and respiratory therapy, um, it was not officially recognized profession at that time, but now it is. Um, so I'm impressed with that vision. Uh, so in order to select students uh, that, that sort of align with our values, we have students answer questions. They write essays, we review the essays, then we interview them. Um, so because it was during pandemic, so what we did is we interviewed students through Zoom. Because of the time difference, we interview them at night, our time at night until midnight, many nights. Um, uh, so 
basically is uh, staff from Lomana University Health and then uh, staff from um, Sarangshan Hospital and also from City University. Um, basically, the student will answer questions. We ask them about critical thinking, communication skills, values, and uh, their uh, self-awareness. Um, so we choose the students that we believe that has the values, that will be willing to serve, um, that will do well as a pioneer in those two professions. Let me remind you all that when we started 30 years ago, communist, uh, China was a communist country, an atheistic country, where it was not allowed to worship. In fact, I can remember, I don't know whether I was with you, Jan, or not, the first time I went, we literally had Sabbath school behind locked doors in our apartment. Uh, you could not be visibly engaged in worship activities. That's changed. Uh, and not the last time, I think the time before that I went, we actually visited three different churches one Sabbath morning. One was in an old Baptist church, I think it was, that had been preserved. They, they let the Adventists use it on Sabbath. One was in a uh, about an 11-story uh, office building that they had taken over one place up there. Uh, it's rather fascinating. They don't take up offerings there the way that we do. They pull out their phone and scan a QR code. You walk up front, scan a QR code, and give your offering that way. Uh, and then they had a baptism on a little patio there with a little waiting pool, had a baptism. And then the third was in a fully organized church, a beautiful new A-frame church there. So, Jan, you want to talk about that, the, the growth of the church in China? I mean, it's been rather incredible. Over the years, I found a number of the nurses were interested in church. We would always try to go to the local church, which is the old church on Sunday. It was one religion, and on Sabbath, it was the Adventists. And um, a number of different nurses would go to church with me. Ultimately, there were a number of employees at the hospitals that ended up being baptized. And so it's quite a mission, and I guess we don't really know where that will end, you know. Um, the but last we time, definitely made an impression. The last time I was there, just, I don't know who was with, Dan was with me. Yeah, yeah there surely. were 42 baptisms that day, yeah. the most I had ever seen. They had, we went to the, the, the big church. There's about five churches in, in Hangzhou now. We went to the main church and didn't know it. We got and they were having a baptism of 45 people in that church. And we had three translators uh, with us. And you can imagine their curiosity and what in the world are those people doing? Uh, they had an outside outdoor tank kind of up on a platform and they were peeking around the corner trying to figure out what in the world was happening in the, this baptism ritual that we were carrying on. Quite a story. Uh, I need to tell one other anecdote that I always chuckle with. Uh, Dr. Gordon Hadley went out and was our hospital president out there for a few years, kind of helped to set the culture of the place. Uh, and about 15 years ago, I was doing whatever I do around here on campus, and my secretary paged me and said, Dr. Hart, the FBI are here to see you. And uh, I said, well, okay, I'm kind of busy right now. Can you have them wait a bit? No, no, they want to see you now. I said, okay. So I came down to my office, and here were two FBI agents, and they chatted about this and that and the other thing, and uh, finally they came to the point and said, how well do you know Gordon Hadley? And I said, well, I know him pretty well. Do you have any reason to suspect his loyalty to the U.S.? And I said, there is nobody more true blue American than Gordon Hadley. And it turns out that Gordon Hadley, while he was administering the hospital in China, we just got word to help start a, take over a hospital in Afghanistan. And so Gordon flew from China to Afghanistan and triggered something in the FBI screening that says, why is an American commuting between China and Afghanistan, and came to check him out. Uh, I sent him up to meet Gordon and, and Alfie, and she fed him chocolate chip cookies, and it was all OK after that. So. <laughs> Anything more you all want to say? I mean, it's interesting to watch what's going to happen. I mean, right now, Servant and Shaw has become probably the second or third ranked hospital in the entire country of China. 8,000 beds, multiple campuses, uh, people come there to learn the American way of management. Uh, and now we're moving more into education, two programs, dental hygiene and respiratory therapy, training otherwise. They still want to send people here, still coming. Dan, you want to talk about that, some of the things that are still happening? So we still get to work with them. Uh, our original contract was to build the hospital and to operate it for five years. And at the end of that time, 
the Chinese government and the, our colleagues basically said, can you stay longer? We'll make you consultants, even if you're not running the place. And we've been consulting with them for the 30 years that they've been open. It has been amazing to watch them attract attention from other hospitals in China. And as Dick mentioned, they are known for their nursing program, for their quality improvement program, for their management. And so they attract hospital administrators, nurses, physicians from all over China, come to Hangzhou to see how they operate and, to, and they present seminars. And when they do this, of course, they are talking as atheist, communist party members. They will always mention in Chinese to their, the people they're talking to, you know, we were started with a partnership with Loma Linda University. They're church people. <laughs> they're Christians. And uh, that continues, that, that message continues to get out as they talk about we're not here to make money, we are here to serve people. And that seems to be something that they emphasize every time they do that. We have a few people here that have worked over there, and I'm gonna ask Jack and Sharon Bennett to stand first and turn around and face the audience. They were our last employees over there. Jack's a surgeon, Sharon's a lawyer, but over there she was an English teacher. Uh, and so uh, thank you, Jack and Sharon, for your service over there. Are there others here that have rotated in China? I didn't scan it through the odds. Somebody's raising, yes, please stand up. Steve Hildebrand, can't see who's in the back. As I said, we have had, a, yes, uh, Bill Hayton as well. We've had around 2,000 people over 30 years from Loma Linda and elsewhere among our alumni that have spent time in China. And as I said, over on uh, Monday and Tuesday, we were, had the Chinese group from both the Shaw Foundation that funded the original hospital and the Sherwin Shaw Hospital here. And we'll show a brief, Let's go off. Uh, a brief video clip of our giving them the award. We gave them our meritorious service award at the board meeting. So let's show that now. It's now our privilege to give the Shaw Foundation and Sir Ronald Shaw Hospital uh, our most prestigious award here at Loma Linda, the Meritorious Service Award. Congratulations Thank very much. Thank you. In recognition of exemplary service, Sir Ronald Shaw Foundation is presented with the Loma Linda University Health Meritorious Service Award, February 27, 2024. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And similarly, in recognition of exemplary service, Sir Renren Shaw Hospital and presented with the Loma Linda University Health Meritorious Service Award, February 27, 2024. Congratulations, very much. It's been said that old friends are the best friends, and this friendship will continue. The lady there is Sir Renren Shaw's sister-in-law. There's two sister-in-laws that are still living. Sir Ronan Shaw died in 2017 at 107 years old. Uh, and Mona Fong, his uh, wife, died a few years later. But the two, uh, Mona's two sisters came as part of the uh, representation from the Shaw Foundation. So thank you all. Thank you for rather incredible story and experience that is continuing and will continue. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jehovah Shalom. Incredible music from Uganda. And thank you all for being here. What a special evening, a way to start the Sabbath and celebrate Loma Linda's legacy and heritage and service around the world. Delighted to have Gabriela Navarro offer our closing prayer this evening. Let's go ahead and stand so we can pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, how great thy art. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for having us here today among friends, colleagues, ex and former classmates. Lord, thank you, Heavenly Father, for today. Thank you for this weekend of homecoming, Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you have done for us and everything that you will continue to do for us. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be part of your mission the mission of Jesus, Lord. Heavenly Lord, as we conclude this program, I pray that you will be with us, that you will give us a humble heart of service, a heart of obedience, Lord, to go out and tell the world of your wonderful love, Lord, that you have for us. Help us, Lord, as we move forward, Lord. 
with our gifts, Lord, our talents. Help us, Lord, that we may use them in your vineyard. Be with everyone here, Lord. Bless us and bring us back here tomorrow as we once again will gather together, Lord, in this homecoming. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Sabbath school tomorrow morning. We'll be having the parade of flags and some more stories from around the world. Uh, and then both early and late church services will be here. Mission Vespers tomorrow afternoon at 4.30.